Welcome to the 1980s, the decade of new wave music and bizarre fashion, and the first decade on our little time travel trip that I actually haven't been alive for. So it's the first time that I hadn't really been around to experience the culture that these shows came out from. I'd like to say that that would make my opinions here completely unbiased, or at least from the perspective of a neutral observer, uh, but I don't think that's going to be entirely true. I've noticed that people tend to have a bias against cartoons from the decade after they stopped being kids, and the decade from before they were born. My parents did show me some of the shows that they watched back in the day, and I had a hard time understanding how they could have ever been into any of them. Up until I did this list, my impression of the 1980s was that it was all either overly saccharine slock, all of the get-along gang, or a huge, huge ocean of 22-minute toy commercials. Those things definitely exist. However, as I did more and more research, I could tell that my initial impressions were wrong. I've learned that the 1980s were fucking insane. Fun fact, during class one day, we watched a video that the students had made back during the 1980s. And my first thought when watching it was, oh my god, they really did dress like that. Like, with how much of the 1980s tends to get mocked as a decade, it's easy to just dismiss a lot of it as parody. Like, this has to be exaggerated. There was no way people actually dressed, acted, or thought like that. But no, a lot of it is entirely accurate. For as weird and wild Wild as some of the cartoons in this day and age claim to be. The main theme I now associate with the 80s is just weird and wild. Remember, this is the era that brought us Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, and robots that transform into cars. And those ideas are still around today because they're some of the more sane cartoons from this era. If I were to make a list of the weirdest cartoons of all time, it would be loaded with 80s shows. Possibly more so than anime shows. This decade was no stranger to giving us things like Jace and the Wheeled Warriors. Like, what even is this? Fantasy warriors in outer space riding dump trucks against evil alien plants that shoot lasers. And Jace's team apparently has a robot, a magician, and a little girl. The weirdest thing that the 2010s has is, what? Adventure Time? There is no competition. The rules are mostly the same as always. Every show on this list must have had at least 13 episodes, aired in the 1980s. And I need to be able to find footage, obviously. I have this rule because if something has its plug pulled before then, then it's safe to say that it was seen for the mistake that it was. 13 episodes is what you need to have a full season of a show. The shows on this list were what people actually watch during the day. Although I wouldn't blame you if you didn't know that anything on this list existed. Let's just say that there are some 80s properties that even the most desperate corporate hack isn't going to want to reboot. I do have one new rule though. I'm not going to put any shows that I've already reviewed on this list. All three of the 80s ones. Garbage Pail Kids probably wouldn't make it anyway, and I'll tell you where the others actually would have been. But I want to give some new trash a chance to shine. Actually, shine is probably not the right word to use in that metaphor. Let's give some new trash a chance to smell. Let's you and me embark on this journey. With the cartoons that I'm going to show you, this is going to be a treat for both of us. Or, at least for you, it's, it's probably going to be a nightmare for me. Alright, let's count down. Top 10 Worst Cartoons of the 1980s. Chuck Norris stars in Chuck Norris Karate Commandos. Chuck Norris, he's got nerves of steel and strength to match. Here's the mystery on my show, the best show. Mr. T. I can't make this kind of pressure. I must confess, one more dusty road. It would be just a road too long. The biggest stereotype of the 1980s is that literally every cartoon was basically a toy commercial. And there's definitely a lot of truth to that. He-Man, My Little Pony, Transformers, each of them had a toy line. Actually, each of them existed because they had a toy line. And the 80s is definitely responsible for the trend less to this day, where if a cartoon isn't selling enough toys, then it's deemed a failure and cancelled. For years and years before the 80s, though, it was actually illegal to make a cartoon that was just a commercial. It's the reason that the 60s Hot Wheels cartoon was cancelled. But in 1984, these limitations were stripped back, and it became a free-for-all. It was determined that the market would decide what was good for kids to watch. It was a decision so bad and corporately driven that you'd think Agit Pai made it. But it wasn't long before every single toy in existence had a cartoon. You might think I'm joking, but every toy had a cartoon, including the Rubik's Cube. Rubik. 
I don't even know why I'm surprised. A terrible merchandise-driven cartoon based on the Rubik's Cube is like the most 80s thing in the world. If you want to know what the bad side of 80s animation looks like in one full swoop, watch this show. You know, if you could find an episode, it was harder than it should have been. You'd probably think that this show was actually like the trend gone foul. Kind of like Mega Babies was a gross-out cartoon that tried to go above and beyond the trend of gross-out. This was a cartoon that could only exist because of so many other ridiculous toy-based cartoons getting greenlit, making it seem sane. Uh, but, uh, no. This was actually one of the first cartoons in the toy-based trend, coming in right at 1983, and lasting for a blessedly short 13 episodes. And boy, is it the perfect template for selling out. First of all, they gave this Rubik's Cube this god-awful gremlin face. That thing is hideous! Why, why would you do something like that? Why would you put that face on the Rubik's Cube? It doesn't look cute. It looks like it wants to eat the character's brains! Especially because you're trying to sell Rubik's Cubes. But if you think that's bad, listen to its voice. Somebody else had problem too. Not only does it look like a gremlin, it sounds like one too. Without his powers, I think Rubik is scared of heights. There! Oh, thanks, Carlos! But Lisa still has problems! I'm right, to I promise! But I can get past all that. Actually, no, I can't get past that. Fuck this design! Like, how do you make a Rubik's Cube, which is just a fucking cube, how do you make a Rubik's Cube look so goddamn hideous? But if you can get past that, this thing actually has some more tools in its arsenal to make you hate it. As in, the Rubik's Cube is actually a sanctimonious piece of shit. So, the premise of the show actually has, you know, nothing to do with puzzles. Instead, it's that these kids have a magic cube thing that has unlimited magic powers. But every episode is pretty much the Rubik's Cube telling the kids why using his powers are a bad idea. It's like the Fairly Odd Parents, but just post poof Wanda for 22 minutes. Seriously though, this little shit is overpowered to the ninth degree. So much that he's able to know the plot ahead of time. In one episode, two goons are trying to get everyone to run away from an orphanage with a uh, giant boulder for, I don't know, pick any typical bad guy reason. I think it was because of money. And the cube knows that they did it because writing is hard. Ignoring that, the animation is really choppy and reminiscent of Hanna-Barbera. The voice acting is really, really bad. The kids who play the kids clearly don't know how to act, and all of these characters are super bland. Normally I'd bring these things up first and foremost, uh, but well, when we're talking about the 80s, these are kind of the rule and not the exception. Most characters were bland and boring. Most animation was pretty damn choppy. Bringing that up is like bringing up the fact that most of the worst cartoons of the 2000s were made in cheap flash animation. Most of the cartoons on this list are going to have these problems, so just assume that that comes standard. I know that the question, how do you write a show about the Rubik's Cube, has no answers, but some Something tells you that they picked a particularly wrong answer. And you know what the absolute, absolute worst thing about this show is? The Rubik's Cube cartoon is only number 10 on this list. It only barely made it on. And if I were including the shows that I already reviewed, it wouldn't have made it on the list at all. I am, I am beginning to regret this decision. All of my decisions. The problem with making the worst cartoons of each decade list is that generally what we think of as the flavor of a decade, the trends and stereotypes, they usually don't begin in like 1980 and then end in 1989. Now what we think of 2000s cartoons tends to start around 2004, and what we know of as 90s cartoons starts with DuckTales in 1987. The only time that a decade's flavor started at the start of a decade was in 2010. Like the amount of change that happened in that year was just crazy. So a lot of the shows on this list can be better described described as a 70s hangover, rather than a cartoon of the 80s. Case in point, Shirt Tales. I don't know what's more stupid, the name of the show or how it came about. If you thought that a show based on the Rubik's Cube was a stupid idea, the Shirt Tales characters were based on Hallmark greeting cards, which they apparently still sell for some reason. As you might imagine, like with the Garbage Pail Kids, there was no story to begin with, so they needed to find something to do. And you would not believe the genius idea these people did to give these cards some kind of story. Actually, you would if you knew who made this. This show is made by Hanna-Barbera, who decided in the 70s that being creative was overrated. So, it's a Scooby-Doo ripoff. Actually, it feels more like a terrible precursor to Rescue Rangers. They're just typical park animals by day, mystery solvers by night. And would you just listen to that theme song? Who do you call when you're caught in a jam? Too scared to stay. Too scared to scram. It's a cinch. You're a pinch. 
You call. Hammy. Rick. Hager. Pike. And Foggy. The Shirt Tales. Yeah, that's one of the greats of the 80s. DuckTales, Mask, a pup named Scooby-Doo, and of course, Short Tales. And I love how the park keeper just shrugs at the end of it like, I don't know why we decided to make this a cartoon either. So what's the actual show like? Well, half the time, the characters' thoughts appear on their shirt so they can save money on voice actors. And for no other reason. Maybe it happened in the cards, I, I don't know. Almost every single scene transition just spins around like a newspaper. But other than that, it's the animation quality that was killing Hanna-Barbera at the time. Cookie cutter characters, cookie cutter animation, following the Scooby-Doo template. The first episode is about the characters trying to track down a suit of armor, which just gets up and walks out of the museum. The security guard doesn't even try to chase it down. Uh, the shirt tails have a car that's able to detect gold, and instead of mining, they're tracking down a suit of armor for a commissioner, who apparently doesn't know that you can't wear a green shirt in front of a green screen. <laughs> they think they can keep Mr. Gold from bringing gold into the country. <laughs> hey, I got it! Mr. Gold is the gold smuggler! I changed my mind. This is the most brilliant show in the history of television. Bad, bad. I don't even know how to describe this one. Yeah, the California Raisins had a cartoon. You know what, I don't even know why I'm surprised. Most cartoons in the 1980s were made for advertising things. So why not just cut out the middleman and make a show out of an existing advertising mascot? Honestly, this is probably a little bit less surprising than our last entry on this list. Because the California Raisins were actually really popular. Their design was created by Will Vinton, a legendary stop-motion animator who unfortunately passed away earlier this month. They appeared in an Emmy-winning animated short. Uh, their signature song, which is the theme song for this show, even appeared on the Billboard Hot 100. They even almost had an NES game. They were pretty damn popular. So making a cartoon about raisin mascots wasn't the worst idea, at least at the time. Then again, pretty much everything that happened in the 1980s wasn't the worst idea at the time. It was a weird decade. Unfortunately, the cartoon is not good, and there's a reason for this. You might want to sit down and try to stay calm, because this is probably hard to believe. It's very, very hard to come up with ideas for a show about an anthropomorphic raisins. I mean, there was an idea behind the characters. The California raisins were in a band, but the show really isn't about that. I mean, yeah, they're in a band in the show, but most episodes aren't about that. Their being in a band does have some effects on the show overall, like, the show is a musical, but they don't write their own songs or anything of the sort. They basically sing covers, and colossally miss the point of the songs that they do cover. You guys know that the song isn't literally about shopping, right? It's not like they're even changing the lyrics or anything. It's it's not a parody. It's just a straight-up cover. But because they're doing it in a shopping mall, that means the song's different now, right? No. The song is still about not marrying the first girl you meet. A uh, very kid-friendly song, by the way. The songs rarely have anything to do with, you know, the plots. They just randomly break into song at random points in the episode. Uh, but let me actually explain what the show is about. Hey, check out those cute veggie girls. Uh, I'm totally bummed. Like, I hit my plastic earrings in the microwave, okay? And, like, my mom, like, totally melted them. Oh. Do you really want to know? The episode that I'm showing you clips from is about the California Raisins becoming the King of Luxembourg, or Luxemburger, or whatever they call it, because every single name in the show has to be a produce-based pun. However, this episode isn't a very good example of the overall show because this actually has an interesting plot. Stop me if you've heard this one before. One of the characters learns that his diploma is invalid, so he needs to go back to high school. What about a camping episode? A family reunion episode? Even in the 1980s, these 
These are the most stock, cliche plots imaginable. You can imagine how boring they seem now. There are only 13 episodes. You'd think they'd come up with an original idea for at least a few of them. Not helping is the fact that all the raisins are mostly indistinguishable. The tall one talks to the different boys, but pretty much everyone has the same personality. They largely act the same, they largely talk the same. The California raisins are usually seen as one entity for a reason. They don't have established personalities. Like, when I found out that there was a California Raisins cartoon, I thought it would be more interesting than this. But no, this is one of the most boring, bland cartoons that I've ever seen. The theme song is pretty decent, though. Here's our two cool license. And our official registered trademark. Uh, next, please. Considering the amount of terrible video game cartoons that came out in the 80s, I needed to put at least one of them on the list. Immediately I thought, the Super Mario Super Row Show. Uh, but nah, that one's really too corny to hate. At least it's entertainingly bad. Although the Zelda cartoon is a special kind of awful, but... No, I had to go with the worst of them. Master. Holy hell, where do we even begin? Captain N may as well be called Nintendo Power, the show. I mean, Captain N's powers come from the Power Glove, but literally, it could just run on Nintendo Power. Because the show was basically there to just market the latest Nintendo game, and showcase cool things that you'd beg your parents to buy. But that's every cartoon in the 1980s. Captain N is on this list in part because it's exceptionally bad at it. The show is about an everyday kid named Kevin being pulled into Video Land by a princess. First of all, Video Land sounds like a rental store, not a fantasy kingdom, or hell, even a video game kingdom. I don't know why they couldn't have called it Nintendo Land. Maybe they wanted their blatant marketing push to be a little bit more subtle. The first problem with the show is clearly the characters that they picked. Castlevania, Mega Man, incredibly popular series, good choices, but Kid Icarus? That wasn't even in the top 30 best selling NES games. I know that using Link or Mario would have been redundant. You could have picked someone other than him. I mean, it took, what, 25 years for him to get another game afterwards? No, the Game Boy 1 doesn't count. Also, Simon looks like he's about to scale Mount Everest. Why does he look more like one of the Ice Climbers than an actual Vampire Slayer? And as for Mega Man... <laughs> That's not Mega Man. How do you fuck up the default color of the Blue Bomber? Also, he has this really obnoxious voice that was obnoxiously popular back in that era. Thanks, your highness. I'll roll mega muscles with this. A newspaper. Why, thanks, dupe. Are you okay, Mega Man? I hate my birthday. It reminds me that I'm different. You'll also hear it on Toad from the Super Mario Brothers show. You know, that type of voice that sounds like the character's been gargling with broken glass while they're taking a shit. Honestly, I'd rather listen to the cutscenes in Mega Man 8 than listen to this guy. What do you make of these? These? Seems to be energy resources. Let's recover all the energy immediately, Mega Man. But where is Dr. Wily? That's a good question. We may be able to locate another energy emission from the radar room. When we find that media, we'll find Dr. Wally. The villains, though, are even more baffling. Mother Brain, I get. Eggplant Wizard, I, I get, because you chose Kid Icarus for some reason. I get Dr. Wily, but, uh, King Hippo. You know that King Hippo isn't some diabolical evil bent on taking over the world, right? He he's just a boxer. He's not even the villain of Punch-Out. I mean, Punch-Out doesn't have a villain, but he he's not the final boss. Yeah, I get that you can't have Mike Tyson as a villain of your show. I mean, he's too busy solving mysteries, but... If King Hippo is here, that means that Mike Tyson exists in Videoland. And the many countries that the other boxers come from exist in Videoland. Also, Mother Brain being the villain of the show kind of makes Samus' absence a, a little bit odd. I can only come to the conclusion that she's dead. The continuity of Captain N is strange. 
And, and don't say that this stuff doesn't matter or that I'm just nitpicking here. Like, kids are the people most likely to care about this kind of shit. This is what they bring up over the stories, or the writing, or the dialogue, or the voice acting. Especially when it's meant to advertise the games that they're going out to buy. To be honest, the show probably deserves its own review, but if I had to sum up its main problem in a few sentences, it's that I hate all of these characters. Every single one of them is annoying. Kevin is bland. The princess is bland. But everyone else is just annoying. Simon Belmont is the type of arrogant that you just want to punch in the face. Watching him makes me want to break every single copy of Castlevania that I can find, after intentionally dying a million goddamn times. Kid Icarus is annoying because he's another sanctimonious piece of shit. Yeah, I know he's an angel and it kind of comes with the territory, but what doesn't is his stupid talking gimmick. Kid Icarus, Mega Man, we've got to find the princess. Don't worry, it's Maximus. She's safe with Simon. There's a reason that most NES games didn't have dialogue. Kid Icarus ends random words with Icus because that doesn't get old very quick, Icus. And Mega Man, well, can we all agree that Mega Man should be a silent protagonist forever and ever? Like, make it a rule that if he talks again, Capcom's corporate headquarters gets teleported to the moon? It just seems that whenever the Blue Bomber starts talking, or when there's talking at all involving the Mega Man franchise, I get a little bit miffed. The next one is a tie. It's actually a three-way tie, if you can believe it. It would be a four-way tie if I didn't disclude Fonz and the Happy Days Gang. What's going in this entry? Number seven is pretty much every single goddamn Hanna-Barbera animated spin-off of a sitcom. Did you know that Mork and Mindy had a cartoon? Well, it does. Did you know that Laverne and Shirley had a cartoon? They joined the army. Did you know that Gilligan's Island had a cartoon? It did, except it wasn't called Gilligan's Island. It was called Gilligan's Planet, and it was about them going into outer space. The reason they couldn't build a boat on Gilligan's Island is because it would end the series. No, I'm not joking. They tell you what happens in the theme song. Remember, the original Gilligan's Island has one of the most iconic theme songs of all time. Even if you've never seen the show before, you know the theme song. The mate was a mighty sailing man. The skipper brave and sure five passengers set sail that day for a three-hour tour with gilligan the skipper too here's the wet farts they put together for the cartoons theme song brand new story about the castaways we left our tiny island after years and months and days they're they're not even singing they're just speaking in rhyme we built a little spaceship. It's crude, but it could fly. And could they sound any more unenthused? I mean, I, I guess not, considering they're making an, an outer space cartoon spin-off of Gilligan's Island. That greatly misses the point of Gilligan's Island. Oh yeah. If the professor could build a fucking rocket ship out of coconuts, you'd think they'd be able to get off that island a lot sooner. And I thought the Fonz theme song was ridiculous. because the narrator was sounding like he was making it up as he went along. There really isn't much to say about these shows individually. They're all soulish cash-ins. I'd say that I don't know why they exist, but I do. We all know. They were extremely popular properties that a company could cash in on. And that company is Hanna-Barbera, which became the king of cashing in. People seem to be surprised when they watch how Tom and Jerry has been treated over the years. Like nowadays with things like Tom and Jerry and The Wizard of Oz. But I, I don't see why. That that's completely, completely normal and sane in Hanna-Barbera's oeuvre. This has been the company's shtick since the 70s. And if you're not liking the harsh words that I'm saying about them now, you're not going to like the 70s list at all when they're probably going to make up every single entry on the list. In the 70s, they had 80% control of the market, but as they kept producing soulless shit like this, that reused old animation, old plots, old properties, they went down to holding only 20% control of the market of children's entertainment in the 80s. Imagine if in a decade, Disney Today fell down to having like only one television station and not having enough money to make an animated film at all. This is why one company having such a huge control over the entertainment market is so bad, by the way. Ahem. <laughs> Just look at this shit. Laverne, let's join the army! Yeah, let's make an enormous decision on a whim that will cost us several years and quite possibly our lives. Sounds like it's gonna be a good rip-roaring time. A commanding pig? 
And didn't Laverne and Shirley already do this in an episode? On some level, this could be so bad it's good, which is why these shows aren't higher on this list. But seeing all these shows together, it, it just really makes me lose my sense of humor. It's all the fucking same. The novelty is lost. And keep in mind, this isn't even the first time they've done this. They've been doing it since the 70s with the Partridge Family in 2200 AD. Cities rising in the sky, freeway traffic jetting by, future's here for us to see, it's 2200 AD. Throughout the entire decade of the 70s and even into the 80s, Hanna-Barbera had basically two ideas. That is it. Scooby-Doo ripoff and Flintstones ripoff. But sometimes they would get really, really, really creative and rip off something that they didn't own. Fonz and the Happy Days gang essentially tried to rip off Doctor Who. Laverne and Shirley, a series that, for what I can understand, took place in reality. Uh, in the intro of their cartoon, they get abducted by a spaceship. If I was an avid viewer of Laverne and Shirley, I, I don't know what I'd think. I'd either be outraged or laugh my ass off in wondering just what they put in the screen and what they were smoking to think that anyone would buy this. If you want an in-depth look, I did a review of an episode of Fonz and the Happy Days Gang a couple years back. It's uh, rough around the edges, but it just showcases the insanity that's in pretty much all of these shows. I don't really have much new to say about any of them. I can't take this kind of pressure. I must confess one more dusty road. It would be just a road too long. 